And we're live from the crime scene. Okay, so, is everybody in the right room? This is the place where everyone wants web development to finally be fun and enjoyable. Again. Again. It was back in the 90s, then it got lost for a while. So, if you are so inclined, we will be showing tooling that we built to eliminate tooling. I know that's weird, but web development got really hard over the last decade for everyone. So, um, if you use Yarn, or have it already installed, you can run this. We're gonna be playing with it and showing videos and things surrounding it, what it nets you. But it's a yarn global ad at WC factory slash CLI. Uh, we'll show it later as well, but I just wanted to get that out there ahead of time. So my name is Brian Oledike, or B at BTO Pro. I've been in the Drupal community for way too long, like 14 years or so. And I have one cup of coffee there that's not accurate. I have soda today. So it makes me talk fast. So. For just very quick context, we work on a project called Elms Learning Network. Uh, it's a series of educational applications at Penn State. So as a result, we have to build a lot of interfaces. And so the way we envision these interfaces and these systems kind of looks like this. It doesn't matter so much what they are. It's just that whenever we have new applications, we have to build uh, fresh. Because the whole reason we're there is to build whatever this thing is. Because we couldn't have bought whatever it is, right? So we build educational innovations. And so as a result, we need to create kind of interface patterns similar to what you would find on like a Microsoft or a, uh, a Google, right? So Google has a big, big new idea. They throw it out a new domain, give it some branding, but you know how to use it because you're already logged in, right? So try and apply that to education context. So as a result, you have an interface. This is Drupal-based. I click somewhere, I go to another interface. It's Drupal-based, right? So we have a lot of UIs to build as a result of this that those UIs need a lot of consistency, otherwise students are gonna get lost in our context. We have several thousand students that take courses using these systems at Penn State. So, uh, after lots of walking in darkness and hating the web, we found this, I should say, Michael found this website uh, that we then uh, ended up using. So it's webcomponents.org. This is a community space that you can go to and find out more about web components, uh, which is a standard of the browser we can all use now. So I don't shut up about web components or I use the hashtag use the platform uh, because if you're a standard as opposed to like some fancy library, you kind of need your own marketing, right? Because this isn't like Facebook pushing out all kinds of marketing and running conferences necessarily. This is a specification of the browser we can all leverage. Now I say all and this talk has changed since last year um, because all these green lights keep lighting up, which is amazing. And so what this means is without a polyfill, these things just work in all these different browsers. Um, and I'm not sure if you're aware, there was an announcement about Edge that later this year, Edge is going to hollow itself out and basically be Chromium under the hood. Which, for those of us that have hated Microsoft all these years, what an incredible announcement to not have to account for Edge anymore. Now I'll just have to account for IE11, at which point I'll just put a message that says, upgrade to Edge, please. So, yay! And it might even come to Mac OS, but no one cares. So why web components and what are they? You didn't tell us what they were at all. So let's say that forever we made a little HTML block that looked like this, right? And we all agree, we know what that would do. This is gonna style the color of the text blue and I've got a link and it points somewhere. So if we were to make that a web component, web components allow us to generate our new HTML tags. It's a standard way of telling the browser, hey, that thing that you see, I actually want you to interpret it as that. Right, so it's kind of this by reference, much more semantic. You can actually generate your own, right, like attributes and things. And then I could say, well, the name should show up there and basically get the exact same thing, but as this new HTML tag. So you, if you've used component architecture, you might say, well, this is like React or Angular or Vue or like, why wouldn't I use Pattern Lab? This stuff has existed before. And I'd say you sort of right. They're very similar concepts. Um, and I try to, I'm starting to try and view them like this. So like, if you're building with Legos, React, Angular, and Vue, they're kind of giving you this grid plate ahead of time. They're saying these are kind of the ways in which you would put your components together, and you build components in this same play space. But you would have a, an Angular play space, and a React play space, and a Vue play space, and you'd work in those. Web components are at times almost like the resin used to generate the Lego blocks. <laughs> right? So if you use a lot of resin, eventually you do get a Lego block. 
And then with that Lego block, I could put it in the angular reactive view grid plates, right? Does that, does that kind of make sense what the difference between those are? Now you could, yes, you can use like angular and view and react together at some level, but you, you really wouldn't just generally speaking do that. So web components are kind of a spec lower. Um, so as an example, let's say we had a JSON editor. If you were gonna need to edit this JSON, right, I might write this for Vue or Angular or React and then I'd go and look for the React JSON editor um, or the Vue JSON editor. And so what this tag is gonna do is that whenever I type in the thing and it's invalid JSON, it's gonna notify me and just say, hey, that's not valid anymore. So what that might look like to get it implemented as web components, you have a polyfill. And so polyfill is this one line that loads that and it figures out, hey, this browser, IE 11, Edge at the moment, it doesn't support all the parts of web components that, it, that are needed for my page to run, so I'm gonna inject this a little additional JavaScript. Then, we're gonna use this new type of module that the browser gives us, called script type module. Has anyone seen one of these before? They're pretty new. Um, it's just a different way of assembling the page. So if you think as this scrapes down and it's rendering, it goes script, oh, I'll load that script, I'll load that script, I'll load that module, it goes ooh. I gotta wait and assemble all the pieces as little discrete pieces, combine them into one file, then execute. And that might seem counterintuitive, right? Because if I want this to load really fast, I don't want it to wait a whole lot. But what this lets you do is start to have statements like this that look a lot more like Node on the back end to say like, hey, import these files, figure out where all those things lead to, and then execute it as JavaScript. It's subtle, but it has uh, huge implications. Um, so then on the page, it might look like this, right? I've got JSON hyphen editor, and then you see there's value there, which then I just throw in my little JSON blob in this example. Now inside of that tag, right? Because back here we had the reference to import that JavaScript file. So this is what's in that file is, this is not all web components, but generally web components are gonna flow like this. You're gonna have the references to other things you wanna use. So going back to that import, why that's important, I can pull in other people's web components. So in this case, I pulled in something called paper hyphen text area, which is the designed asset on that previous page that has, this is the JSON editor. Then, you know, this is just comments. And I say JSON editor extends, in this case, Polymer element. But what the, the web component standard is letting us do is create classes that relate directly to those custom elements. So if you were to write things in vanilla JS, for example, which is just your stock, this would say like HTML element, so that you're actually extending the definitions of the browser. So from there, everyone knows this looks, right, it looks like CSS. So you write CSS that's scoped and delivered just inside that component. Now you can also write a lot simpler CSS as a result of this, right? Because that little component I shipped you has all the styling baked into it. Uh, as a result of Shadow DOM, which is part of the specification, shadows from outside can't get into this, which at first seems annoying, but has incredible implications for design portability. I can ship you this and it will look the same everywhere, no matter what else you have going on. I don't have to even think about it. If I can test this in a vacuum, I'm sending it out in a vacuum effectively. Has now, anyone ever made a change to a component and then broke something else in another section of a website? Oh, yeah, we did for like 11 years. Um, over and over and over again. So this that's a massive game changer in the specification alone, just that one capability. You also get this colon host, which is effectively saying like style the element itself, right? So this is the host element. All of that, right, we can do other things like, hey, this is, a, this is an attribute. So if that attribute is on my custom element, then behave this way. And then we can also style other tags. So in this case, there's paper hyphen text area, which is, I got that tag from somewhere else, put it in place here. This is gonna look somewhat what we're used to historically. This is, called, this is a CSS variable. And so CSS variables are everywhere, which means you can then say var whatever in your code, and then someone else can set a CSS variable, and that'll cascade down and overwrite that one value. This little block here, though, which is definitely not normal looking syntax, that's a, like kind of a mix-in, if you're used to SAS with mix-ins, where you have like this block of code. Um, this is a capability Polymer ends up getting us, is it'll apply that mix-in appropriately and say all these styles, inject them at this correct area. 
So from there, the HTML, we have our paper hyphen text area. This is definitely going to look non-standard to people, but this is data binding. And so with our Polymer elements, we can just say, you know what, if our tag has a label as a property, right, so someone writes JSON hyphen editor label equals stuff, place stuff here, right, which then that tag can say, oh, well, I've got label, place label here, right, so you basically turn the front end into one giant API to leverage. So then when I want to go find something like a text field, I go search webcomponents.org. There's a lot, there's 1900 elements or so uh, at this point, most of which are compatible with each other because they're all following the same principle of scoping. And then just wrapping up what's in that, you get JavaScript that's applying the class. So uh, you get some, some different features of that class element like a connected callback, which is effectively the tag has been added to the DOM, I should do something is what that says. <laughs> Um, you can also then kind of react to changes in values. So in this case, whenever I've placed JSON into that value field, run this function, make sure it's valid, which then updates, updates to look that way. Then at the end, you're going to get this. You're going to get window.customElements.define. You're going to pass, in this case, I use .tag, but it should say JSON-editor, and then you're going to pass it a class. So that that's all you have to do to tell the browser, hey, every time you see this tag, I need you to run this class in order to basically program that tag. So at first, when you do a JSON editor, you go, that was neat. And when you do a button, you go, that was neat. And then when you do 162 elements that we've published publicly, and you just keep leveraging your elements in other elements because it works just like HTML, and you can just keep stacking them, then you start to get into things like this. So if you want the world's most accessible video player, I suggest you run this one tag and now you have the world's most accessible video player that is guaranteed to work across every browser in every system you ever put it in and it won't break. Why? Because everything is scoped to it. The JavaScript doesn't leak in, the styles don't leak in. Now, if we made the player poorly, Nikki, I'll blame her if it's made poorly, <laughs> but if it's made poorly, yes, that could influence the DOM in some way, right? But we can test this in a vacuum. This is actually our demo page illustrating how this tag works. Element, 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 element. Everything is an element, so then we can just draw from our own components, right? If, we, if this play button ends up being inaccessible, we update the underlying file for that play button. We don't think about where it was used. That is a game changer for scalability. So what's the barrier to adoption? Because what I just said sounds ridiculous, and I said it really fast because I had a Coke right now. So there's a lot of libraries in this space. There's Polymer, there's Lit Element, there's Skate.js, there's Svelte, there's Slim.js, there's Vanilla.js, which is just implementing a specification. There's a lot of things.js, if you're familiar with JavaScript. All they're doing is they're pretty much giving you the same thing. They're just adding some you know, styling or capabilities on top of the specification. Unlike any other time before, though, these all work together perfectly. There's no, oh crap, the Angular convention is blah, 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 and the React convention, no. These all just work. So I could leverage a Polymer element in a Lit element, in a Skate.js element, in a Svelte element, in a Slim element, in a Vanilla.js element, and it will work. JS knowledge. Uh, there's less training wheels than typical libraries, for sure. So if you're uncomfortable with JavaScript, Matt Mullingworth has a phrase for you at WordPress, which is get ready to learn JavaScript deeply. I don't particularly appreciate that, but you do lose a lot of the training wheels that we had with things like jQuery in Drupal core, right? Where I could just go search Stack Overflow, find one function and know, oh, this is great. However, that function on Stack Overflow would probably have conflicted with your code. If you go to webcomponents.org and find something that just works, it's gonna just work, which is a huge difference. Also tooling tree. Uh, everyone here knows, of course, class, what, Lerna, Gulp, NPM, Yarn, Git, Rollup, Polymer, CLI, Webpack, and Nodar. Yes? Uh, <laughs> no. And what scenarios you'd use them? And what one? scenarios you'd use them, why you would stack them all? No. Okay. They don't, they don't understand. Yes, I'm sorry. Okay. You're going to have to all just leave. <laughs> class, because this is what would happen if you go to any JavaScript conference. This is kind of like word vomit. But what we're going to show you gets, gets rid of that. Uh, because, what, four months ago, we didn't know half of these either. So 
uh, integration knowledge. You need to know how to load the polyfill. You need to understand concepts of compiling for production. You need to know how to develop locally. And did I mention documentation? You should probably write a lot of documentation as well as, like, where do I get the documentation? I don't know how to get documentation. It could be on webcomponents.org, or maybe I read the Polymer documentation. There's a lot of things here to unpack. So <laughs> I know you're saying you were promised fun. And I did not describe fun. I described a blackboard of all kinds of words. But there is hope. We eliminated every part of that slide because we don't want to learn how to do any of that either. It's garbage. To be able to participate in the open web, I should not need to learn this massive stack of things. And so that initial command before that we showed, um, if you go to github.com slash elmsln slash wcfactory, you're going to now see what the guys are going to play with and show you what, what you can use as well. So. Um, using this tooling, right? We didn't just go, if, if you came to our talk last year, we were building some elements. We didn't really get into how we built them. We just said like, this is an element. Well, we've completely refactored our own process and said, well, if we're gonna share our own assets together, we need to be able to run a command and basically get that as our starting point if we're ever gonna get other people to help. So we came up with a command. That command that you run, as we showed before, basically automates the setup of all of those other things that you would need to be able to publish and contribute web components in a sustainable way. So we've pumped out 161 at this point, um, most of which happens with a single command because we're lazy. And so to show part of that lazy, Chuck Lavera is going to uh, talk through how WC Factory works. Hey everybody, uh, I work at the Office of Digital Learning um, at Penn State. Um, Mike over here, and I've been working with Brian for a while now. Um, go ahead and cue this up. So Brian's got you pretty excited for web components, guys. Right? So you can all go out and start building all your web components. But the thing is, you're going to need to organize all those web components, right? You're going to have all these different projects going on and, and all these components. And as he said, 160 or 100. 161. Yeah, it gets pretty out of out of control pretty quick. So go ahead and spin that. Talk on this side. What's that? Because the microphone talk on this side. Oh, so I'll go ahead. Yeah. Whoop. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk you through the tooling we actually use. Uh, so as he mentioned, if you go uh, to Drupal.org and you look for, or yeah, Drupal.org GitHub, and you look for the WC factory under the Elms LN network, you'll uh, come to this sheet, and it's going to go ahead and start the, where's my speed? That's playing, buddy. Okay. So it's going to go ahead and start. If you look down at the bottom of the readme here, you're going to get some uh, install instructions. Here's that command that Brian referenced to you earlier. Uh, you're going to need that CLI factory to get going. So if you don't have that, um, just go ahead and run that. Um, Web Components Factory works on a principle of companies and factories. So you set up a company, then you create a, a bunch of factories inside that company. And then within each of those factories, you have all your elements that are unique to that specific factory. So if you kind of start to think project management, that's where you go with that. Uh, and then you can also publish as well, and we'll get into that. So here we're going to get, we're going to actually start setting up our company. Uh, let's just make a directory for company, uh, and then we're going to initialize our our um, company here. Eventually, <laughs> we're trying a telestration technique. Yeah. So you run WCF start that'll initialize uh, initialize your company, and then you can start uh, filling out the prompts. Um, as you can see, I'm using some of these things. I'm selecting an MIT license. And it's setting up all this stuff in the back end. Now the next thing we'll want to do now that we have, uh, we've initialized our company is we've got some new directories. We want to go ahead and set up a factory and we'll do that with WCF factory. And once we go ahead and set that up, it'll ask us to name our factory. Uh, I call it factory one in this instance because it's our first factory. And then it's going to keep asking you prompts like what is your factory for? Do you um, want to hook it up to a repo, NPM organization, or GitHub? Uh, in this particular example, I'm setting it up with an NPM organization called Testbox, so you can see how I would do that here. Um, I'm using my CGL Devel um, GitHub organization, and then I'm going to GitHub in, under my organization, and I've created a repo, and I'm just grabbing that link, and I'm going to throw that in there. And now, when I create my factory, everything's hooked up, you know what I mean? All my version control's hooked up, I'm hooked up to NPM Publishing, uh, and after that's all done, we want to go ahead and Did you pause me? Nope. Where are we at here? Okay. Yeah. We want to go into our factory. We want to CD in our elements because now we've got a factory we want to we want to build elements for, right? So then once we're in there, we're gonna initialize that by running WCF element. 
Again, this is going to ask us a bunch of prompts. You can notice that there's a bunch of uh, frameworks to choose from. I like to use Polymer. Uh, it's worth noting if you had multiple factories when you went to, to run WCF element that it would ask you, prompt you which factory you'd want to place your element into. But since we only have that one factory, it's just showing that one. So as we keep going here, it's asking if I want to um, name my tag, do I want to include SAS in my, uh, do I want to have custom properties. In a Polymer instance, you definitely want to leverage custom properties because that's where you get all your data bonding and stuff from. Um, so yeah, we definitely want properties. Hacks authoring supports baked in. We'll get into that, but right now it's not really relevant for this particular demo. And then it'll ask you, do you want to uh, add a new property? And you'll go through that same process again. It'll keep asking you as many properties as you want to add. I think I just add two for this example. Um, this name equals stuff, the CSS styles, that's the equivalent to reflect, uh, reflect that to attribute in Polymer, which just lets your, uh, your attribute be known in the DOM, essentially. Um, so here I am, I'm still at, I'm adding another, another uh, example of a property, and this time I'm using email, and I'm working through these prompts. You can see they just kind of repeat themselves over and over again, so it's real, it's real intuitive. Um, after that's all finished, I go ahead and run yarn install, and watch it go. So and, uh, what it's doing now is it's installing all the dependencies for that element specifically, but it's doing it in the correct way. We'll get, it in, get into that later. Once our factory is complete, uh, we get this prompt here that tells us to go work on our elements. Uh, if we go to the navigate to our elements directory, so under factory one element and then our actual tag, um, we can start working on our you know, elements. So we'll run Yarn Start, and what that's going to do is it's going to spin up a visualization uh, server so that we can start working on our element and seeing the changes. We have some documentation. Boom, instant documentation. Yep, you run a demo, so this is our demo tag, looks very similar. Now I'm going to pop this open in code so we can just take a look at it real quick, see what we're getting into. Now I know I'm immediately out of the gate that looks like a lot, but it's not so bad. Um, you're going to want to use this demo file because this demo index.html is kind of tied to your demo. Uh, page here, so watch if I delete that out of there real quick, and then save it out, you're going to notice that that's now gone, and we're just working with the tags, so you can kind of see how they play together. We go back in and look at some other files, important files in our source directory. We have a name tag CSS, a name tag HTML, a name tag JS, name tag properties, you can kind of see in the prompts where we were prompted to uh, set up properties, this is where they live. We're going to actually use those properties inside of our demo folder here. So remember, we have name and email. This is where that data binding comes in with Polymer. It's uh, very nice. So if we go ahead and we put our properties in and then save it out, <coughs> you can see now we have properties, my company, and email in our tag, which is kind of cool. But we can go beyond that even, right? So uh, next thing we want to look at is our HTML, you can see where our properties are coming in now. Um, but we can style those up, we can make those better. But we want to add to our project, maybe we can add a card to make that look nicer. So what we end up essentially doing to make this card is we want to look into importing, as Brian demonstrated, another project from Polymer Paper Card. And the way we would work through that, I'm thinking about it right now on this video, <laughs> is our, one of the files we'll use is our name tag JS, and we'll actually put the import up here. And then once that we build everything, this node modules directory has a complete com uh, listing of all the um, organizations that we've drawn from in other, other libraries. So you can see, I'm looking for Polymer, but I just scrolled past it. There we go. <laughs> so there's Polymer. We're looking for paper card. I don't see it there. So that means I'm going to have to go get that project and put it into my project. So let's see how that happens. We pull out pa package JSON under these dependencies, right? We can see that Polymer is the only dependency, but now if I want to go get that paper card, I know it lives at Polymer organization, backslash paper card, and then obviously I want to pick a version for that. Once I have that version loaded, the next thing that we want to do uh, is go ahead and import it in our name tag JS. Which you're not just going to know that's the name, right? Like, so as we keep making these, you go like, oh, yeah, that's the card I want. Yeah. Right? So we've gone to webcomponents.org and you search for card. And you find the card that you really like. So the, the next thing we want to do now is you start using our paper card, but right, we can't do that yet. It's not in the node modules. It doesn't know. So we have to go build our project again from the factory level. 
And once we rebuild our project uh, with yarn and sole, it's going to go get that package that we just requested and any dependencies that was tied to it and install it for us. And then it will show up under our node modules organization uh, paper card. And this is extremely important, the how WC Factory sets it up. It sets it up in the exact way that you're going to need if you're going to build lots of different elements. So now you see that we're implementing this, this paper card element. And all I'm doing is pulling my previously uh, created um, properties out and just placing them where I want inside that element. And we'll go ahead and get rid of some of the unnecessary divs I'm not using. Which VS Code works really well with web components because that code auto snippet, complete, yeah, that yep. autocomplete snippet just came right from. So now what we want to style. So if we go into our source name tag CSS, you know, we have a separate CSS, a separate HTML, and then a separate JavaScript file. And at the very end of this, when we build our component to publish it, it's going to cram all the, the build is going to basically cram those three files together into one nice JS file. Uh, and it, all, like he was showing, all that syntax, all that stuff that you were having to listen to him talk about, like you don't have to deal with any of that. The, the tooling takes care of it all automatically. So here you see we have our paper card. It's got the uh, the drop shadow. We're going to inspect it just to show you in inside. Uh, we have a card. We have um, you know animated aria stuff. When we get into stuff like buttons, this is important because like paper button has aria stuff baked into it. So when you're talking accessibility and things, you don't even have to worry about it. It's just taken care of for you. Um, next, we want to publish. Right, we've created this element. We want to push to GitHub. If you remember, we set up our GitHub repository earlier. So we're going to do the git status, git add, git commit, git push thing. And then when we refresh this, it's going to version control our factory for us. So now if you start thinking about this in the context of multiple factories within your company, everything's version control, everything's nice and in the library. I mean, you can really start to get into some nice project management, and you don't really have to know the, the barrier entry, because, I mean, I don't know half the... That just ran, like, ten different tooling libraries <laughs> that Chuck doesn't know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so, we get into it now that this is pushed up to GitHub. We're looking through. Uh, we're going to publish, right? So we want to look at uh, run builds. So this is what I was talking about earlier. It's taking all those files, that CSS, HTML, the JavaScript, just pushing it all into one nice file. We're going to make one last commit on our project, and then we're going to publish with Lerna. And we'll touch on what that is in just a second. Yeah, because I don't know what it is. <laughs> um, apologize for my incredibly slow typing. <laughs> but you can see this going out and getting everything and pushing it and saving it to our repository. It's, it's really convenient. Um, and then here we'll do Learn to Publish. It's going to ask you what kind of uh, version you want, like a patch, a major release, a minor release. For the testing, I just use patches. And then it goes off to do its thing. Now if we go back to NPM under our test box organization that we created, uh, refresh, we have our name tag element. And now that element can be used anywhere uh, by anybody. So it gets real nice as far as if I want to use this again or I want to hand it off to one of you to use again, uh, it's easy enough to use. We want to go an extra step further and publish to webcomponents.org. We just go to the publish element over here and copy and paste our organization name into this slot down here and verify that you are indeed not a robot. <laughs> and you too can have your own web component inside an organization. So that's, that's that for installing WC Factory, kind of working through it real quick. We have links and stuff to the videos that you can watch again. But I'm going to turn it over to Mike now, because now that you've seen this on a very fundamental level, I want to let him explain uh, how we can get past things like cards and start looking at a major organization, like what, what that might look like using WC Factory. Thank you, Chuck. I'm Mike Potter. I work with Chuck at the Office of Digital Learning, and I follow Brian around campus and try to clean up his mess. Um, so, what you just saw took us so long to understand and get the tooling exactly right and figure out what Learner was and figure out how to work on multiple elements at the same time. It's not even funny. And I think we're, we're pretty smart, right? Nope. Okay. Never mind. So, it might be faster for you. But, that was 10 minutes. That, that 10 minutes will save you weeks of time. I would say months. Months of time, possibly. <laughs> so, 
what I want to do is take a look at an actual case study, whatever you get going. So how do you manage a bunch of different elements? Because what you're doing is you're going to use this tooling to build your library and maintain a library of elements. So like um, we were just talking to somebody that's on their how many rewrite of a uh, accordion, right? Because every time that they move to a new system, they need the little accordion thing and they're just sick of it. They're like, can't I just maintain a library of elements and reuse them I don't have to reinvent the wheel? Let's take a look at how this tooling might get you there. So we'll take a, an example. We're starting a new university. It's called Gotham University. You ready? Let's do this. Okay. So in this scenario, let's say that at Gotham University, it's broken out into different development teams. So this is a common scenario that we find ourselves in in a community setting or uh, university setting is that We'll be developing um, a library of elements for, let's say, online learning. But then we also work with another development group is, that just wants to put out some standard branding elements for Penn State. All right, so those are like two different component libraries, right? They sort of overlap. They might, they might even use each other's elements. But they're separate organizations, okay? So this is a common... Um, place that you might find yourself in. You can think of it instead of like different colleges, you can think of it like different projects. Like, sure the buttons might be very similar on, on, from project to project. They might use the underlying technology of what a button is and how it operates and the accessibility features, but they're still two separate projects, okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to be a developer that's uh, working uh, in tandem with Gotham's main branding uh, component libraries, and we're going to do um, uh, maintain the College of Sciences branding library as well. And at the same time, we're going to build the new uh, science website for Gotham University. All right. So did I lose anyone there? We'll pick it back up. Let's see if I can let's see if I can explain this better. So whenever you first set up your um, web component factory, um, what you're doing is, as Chuck said, you start a new company. This company could be like Penn State for us. It could be just you as your own developer, okay? But your company is going to define different factories. So these are different projects. It could be different project teams. It could be um, uh, different, just different organizations of some sort, okay? And then on top of that, um, I'm going to be working on this new app that's going to take advantage of my pattern libraries, okay? So this is a very common workflow that you're going to find yourself in. So if we go on. So, I realize this is small, I'm sorry. But basically, this is Gotham Main, this is Gotham Science, and this is Gotham Website. And what we can see here is that we have, uh, in Gotham Main, we have a logo and a footer. And this is something that Gotham's branding experts have put out for us so that we don't have to recreate a footer for every single web presence that we have. Then we have Gotham Science. Gotham Science wants to use components from the main repo, but they also want to be able to control it naturally. So like if there's a different um, search option for the, or different set of links for the footer that they want to implement, they want to be able to control it, okay? They want to be able to pull this in but still be able to control it. And then finally, we have our website. And this is going to be like an app that utilizes those elements. Okay, So whenever we build this website, we're going to be working in each of these spaces. Okay, And whenever you're thinking about how am I going to maintain all of those elements across different organizations and different apps, you can understand how that might get a little complicated. Okay, So let's see how this tooling can help us out. So what you want to do whenever you put out um, modern elements here is use a package manager, some, some type of distribution. I feel pretty confident to say that NPM is the de facto way of getting your elements out for, people to, for yourself to reuse and for other people to reuse. So we want to be able to publish everything that we're doing on NPM, right? So how can we do this? Let's go full screen. All right, stop it right here, Jay. Go back. If anyone's a Penguins fan, they'll know what that is. Okay. Jay's telestration. All the way. Okay. Yeah, go back. 
Okay, so this is the website that we're working on. Um, this is the College of Science. As you can see, or no, skip it. It didn't, I screwed up at the beginning. This is why you record, because <laughs> you would have had to sit through my mistake. Okay, go back. Hey, yep, right there. Okay. So in this example, we're pulling, um, remember that, that logo? So here's that logo. It's Gotham University with a little bat on it. Cool. Um, we also have this footer at the bottom. And so we're working on this website. We're putting it together. Let's, let's <coughs> advance it a little bit to see what that markup looks like. Oh, go back. Right there. <laughs> Where is it? Jay's fired. Jay's fired. Come on. Okay. I must have screwed up. Okay, so we'll take a look at the markup later. Let's say that we're working on this website and all of a sudden we realize there's some branding changes. All right, so it's been passed down for the higher ups that says, we hate the white. We're going to do like um, uh, another brown color. And we want to ita italicize the logo. Okay? So I'm right in the middle of my project. I'm using an element that's now going to be updated from the main site that's being used in another element that's in another organization's library. What's that going to look like? All right? So what we're going to do is we're going to pop open, at the same time we're working on the website, we're going to pop open Gotham logo. And this is an element that's sitting inside of our Gotham main organization. We're going to change the font size. Okay? Or, no, we're not. We're going to italicize it. That's what they said. So we're going to italicize it. Let's uh, speed it up, shall we? No, let's sit through this whole thing. Okay, so bam! Okay, that's good. We italicized it. Now what else did they say? So now I have to update the color in the header that's in another organization. Let's change it. They wanted to change it to Burley Wood. Yes, that looks great. Okay, so then what else do we have to do? So we also need to update the footer, right? Because the color was white in the footer. Now it's Burley Wood. That's great. So, and then, I guess I wanted to fix some other CSS, but just wait. What did we just do? We just changed, we just changed four elements across two organization libraries and updated our pro active project at the same time. That's very difficult to do traditionally. This, this tooling takes care of that, okay? So... Now, we need to publish that, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into my um, Gotham main organization, and I'm going to commit my changes. It's updated color. And I'm going to publish, OK? So where am I? OK. So I'm ready to publish changes that were in the, my main organization. And I'm prompted to say, well, what do you want to update it to? And what I'm presented with is, how do I get this out of here? More okay. videos. Oh, you can't? God, YouTube. OK. Oh. So what it's asking me right here, this is very important. It says, hey, uh, Gotham footer, Gotham logo and default theme, that's uh, irrelevant. Uh, they're at version 0.0.6. I'm going to upgrade all those to 0.0.7 and publish those. Is that cool? I'm like, yes. Because normally you'd have to do that to each and every one and make sure that you're keeping on the same version. But since we're putting them in what's called a mono repo, we're controlling that version for all of, for our whole element library. All right, so if you've ever heard of, has anyone ever heard of uh, Babel? They're a um, polyfill organization um, for Webpack. They have tons of libraries. So they would have to maintain each one of those. 
And then, and a bunch of different organizations said, this is crazy, there's gotta be a better way. They came up with, with this approach that's called mono repos. So we utilize that approach for you. It allows you to not have to keep track of each and every element and, uh, and update those individually. It's a massive uh, headache saver. So we're gonna repeat that process for uh, yeah, we're going to repeat that process for Gotham Science. Same deal, we're going to commit our changes. We're going to publish with Lerna. It's going to ask us if we want to increment our versions. We're going to say yes. It's going to publish those. And now all of these changes are now published live, and we can go on working on our project uh, uninterrupted. What do you think? Impressive, right? I mean, am I right? Um, it's got JavaScript linting yeah. as well. So every, every commit he ran, it's, he's writing good code, but if he wrote bad code, it wouldn't allow it to be committed. All this stuff is just set up. <laughs> so in this example, we were working just with three elements. We have hundreds of elements that we have to work with every day and keep track of them and make sure that we're not, we're pushing all the changes up. It's only possible with this tooling. So, so you might ask, uh, what does any of this have to do with Drupal? How did you get accepted here? <laughs> so there's a web components module on Drupal.org so that you can more easily leverage web components in Drupal projects. There's the plug into it. Chuck is going to run through real fast it yep. being installed and what it does. So we're looking at just the Drupal.org page. Um, yeah, see that sucker up. All right. So we're looking at the Drupal.org page. It's where you go to uh, get the project, um, find out information. Um, this is a plain vanilla D7 site, uh, 763. You can see I'm just using entity tokens, entity API, and libraries because they're required for the web components module to work, but everything else is just out of the box, D7. Um, so if we come down here and we download this folder from over here, we get this package, uh, some important files or directories, this copy the stuff directory is important, uh, and obviously this readme is important. That's where your instructions are gonna be. You need Glo Yarn Global and NPM um, to install Polymer CLI. Which, if you have WC Factory, you already have. Yes, sir. And we're going to take this copy of stuff directory uh, from where we found it in the web components module. We're going to make a new directory and cites all libraries web components. So that's basically what we're going to see here. Um, we're just going to grab those files, copy them, and then I'm going to go into my website, uh, this D7 site that I'm working on, and go ahead, cites all libraries and web components, and then paste those files in there. All right, and the next thing we need to do is run yarn install. Do this on this on the server level first. We're doing this, we do this ahead of time. Yep. So you have, you have to compile web components to be able to hit all browser targets. Okay. So everything we've showed is like pre, prior to compiling. Right, what I'm saying is yeah, the module in Drupal will do that. You have to go separately, install. Correct. And compile everything. Yes. Okay. Uh, I don't know why. There we go. All right, so where are we at here? Okay, so NPM, we we we've uh, we want to implement this HG button similar to how we did that paper card before, right? We published it, so now we want to put that in our Drupal site. So we're gonna walk through that. After you are install, um, we're gonna open up everything in code, and we're gonna look at what we get in there. You can see the important files are the build.js and the package.json. So we take a look at that. There's me messing up. There we go. So these are all the dependencies that come shipped with it. As you go out and get more packages, you'll notice them in this list. Uh, and also, yeah, I mean, these are all the LRN components and node modules. So as you go to get different uh, packages from different organizations, they'll show up in node module. But if I go over to npm install this button, uh, go ahead and run that. You can see now it's inside of the package JSON. And now I just need to append, oh, also you can see the new organization over here. Now I just need to append the build.js. I got rid of some boilerplate stuff that isn't really relevant for this uh, demo. But then you can see I'm appending my uh, build.js to include that new organization and the, the button 
uh, JS that I'm looking for. So I'll go ahead and save that out. Yarn install, it's going to go get all my packages. I'm going to run Polymer build again. It's going to build everything out. Uh, if we look inside that button, we can see how it's used, right? So this is the syntax. So I'm going to create a block and then copy and paste that syntax or that HTML right inside this block. Uh, important little tidbit when you do this, make sure that you choose full HTML and go ahead and save it out. Boom. There's our new button uh, using Web Components, Web Components module. And I'm going to turn it over to Brian to let him keep <coughs> rambling. Mind. Rambling. So, so they're going to follow what Chuck just did there. So there is a build step involved. You're not just writing these components and then they just work. Um, and that's because you have to hit all the different browser targets that are out there as far as IE 11, Edge, right? They don't natively support web components. Um, so you run a command, it takes those files, compiles them to work on those. And then the web components module is making sure that the correct data gets appended to the document so that it just works. Whereas it's kind of like you set this pipeline in motion and then when you make new elements, you make sure they get in scope of the page so that it knows the definition and then you just <coughs> work in your factory. <coughs> so one button, who cares? Right? But if we have a lot of coffee, like these coffee cups here, right? And we we just keep making those components as we have been for the last year, right? We have 161. We don't just have a silly button anymore, right? We start getting above the button. We leverage Chuck's HG button in everything else to build a whole band website that unpacks from a single tag, potentially, right? So like this, like a Lego brick made out of millions of little Lego bricks. All right, that's where, that's where we are right now. So our components sit on top of 200 plus other components. You might say that's a lot of front end assets to push to another browser and you're not wrong. However, once I push you the definitions of those, you have them and I can kind of manipulate and build a whole front end application out of them. So one of those front end applications is called Hacks. If you saw us talk about it here last year and I, I ranted, I had a lot of coffee before. Um, Hacks is one of the only Drupal modules that has concurrent releases of Drupal 6, 7, and 8. I would venture it's probably the only. And you'd say, why are you supporting Drupal 6? Well, it's so I can come to a Drupal event and say we support Drupal 6. <laughs> so it's not just for those. We also make this work in Backdrop CMS and in Grav CMS, two different systems. And Hacks CMS. And if you have enough coffee, you can support any fill in the blank CMS. Why? Because the more of those Lego bricks I make, all we have to do is teach these other systems how to pull them in. And then we have all that functionality, right? It's not just about a button, it's about Nikki's video player. If I want Nikki's video player to show up in Backdrop, I just have to teach Backdrop how to get the reference to the page. Well, we've standardized the tooling, we've standardized the way at which you get those integrated. In all those different platforms as mentioned, you run the same Polymer build command and you'll have it compile, the assets compiled in a way that'll hit every browser target in all of these. So that effectively breaks our theme layer free from any system. So let's say it wasn't just a theme though, because we have 160, well, apparently 163 of these. And so we built hacks for this and you might say, you're not going to ever have enough time to explain what hacks is, Brian, and you're right. So I just have to show you. So hacks is if we decouple enough assets and if the internet still works, there we go, then uh, we can build our own WYSIWYG. And it doesn't have to behave like a crude WYSIWYG of yesterday, right? Like CK editor. I could just reach out and touch this. And because it's web components, the whole front end is effectively an API, right? So right there, that's a meme tag. I made a meme tag because we all like to make memes, but you don't like that meme, we should probably make a new one. So I'm going to search NASA. I just click, that's another web component. I'm searching via headless API, that's another web component. I should for, search for something funny on NASA, but there's nothing funny about solar flares, okay? So major solar flare event. How would I like to present that? I'd say, this is a component. Every one of those buttons is a component. The search is a component. All the input fields are components. Every piece of that is decoupled from a system. The form doesn't come from Drupal anymore. The form sits on the front end. The search results can come from anywhere because they're on the front end. I could search Drupal from inside of this, but again, Drupal just 
happens to be there now. I'm not tied to Drupal forms or template engines or any of that. And I have this API where basically everything I make is its own little mini API. So in this case, Hax is saying, hey, you just selected an image. Other things have claimed they can support images. I know how to map data between these. So if I do want to make it funny, and we meme a major solar flare event, and then we'll put lol, so it's funny. <laughs> now I've got a meme that's coming from NASA, which if I hit save, it says, hey, you saved, and I go to view, all I have to do is teach Drupal 6, in this case, how to render a meme tag and say, well, what, what actually happened there? Well, Hacks just wrote HTML, but it's drastically simplified HTML because now it's web components with all the functionality coming from those components. So we can extend, in this case, Hacks, our editor, by just making more web components. And those work anywhere because we're making Hacks work anywhere um, because it itself is a web component. So that when we migrate to Drupal 7, we're going to go through the whole life cycle, Drupal 6 to Drupal 7, right? Maybe you have lots of projects across different organizations and they use different technologies, right? So that that little card is useful for your team. But imagine you could just have other people add that card into their setup, right? Here's Drupal 7 running the same authoring system that I could search Wikipedia right now because I can search things headlessly and I'm just presenting data the whole time. Anything that I would ever inspect if we call up the DOM, right, we see new, like new custom elements here, right? So there's iron image, there's paper button, paper buttons in a hacks app search result. Search result is in a list. The list is part of hacks app search, right? So you can kind of just keep taking these little tiny pieces and stacking up higher and higher. And they're ultra performant by comparison to previous technologies. Uh, mostly because the web component specification is almost like a layer below where you're traditionally building applications from. Um, if you're used to, if you've ever done anything in like React or like Vue, they have a concept of virtual DOM or VDOM, which is effectively whenever there's a change made to something, it's kind of thinking about it over here, and then it like scrapes and puts it in, in place each time. Web components, the whole DOM is an API, so I can just edit properties directly where they are and you see them reflected. So embed a Wikipedia article because we made a tag called Wikipedia article. Another drastic difference with this way of looking at this problem, that Wikipedia article, the meme tag, any of the stuff that they showed isn't tied to hacks because hacks is just kind of implement, it's just kind of placing the tags there. So if we, if we build like a grid system of some form, that would have support for hidden columns and things or support for taking an image and drag and drop uploading it, that that just uploaded to the backdrop file system and that I could work on manipulating this. If we, I mean, we still have to you know, flesh this out further, but why do we have to build a layout system into Drupal? Like I know there's a talk going on in another room right this minute about the layout system in Drupal, but why is layout specific to Drupal at all? And it's not to knock the work they're doing. They're doing very impressive work. But like, why are you having to teach someone how to lay stuff out specific to Drupal? When in the end, it's just getting on the web somehow. So we've got our, our little grid tag there, which I apparently have to make display the correct direction here. Of course, it would screw up when I'm live demoing it. Nikki must have made a change to it. Um, but so I did just upload an image there, and it's sitting there, and it doesn't have the other placeholders in place because I need them. But I could do it in grav, because again, it's just headlessly loaded there. I could do it in Drupal 8, because we have a plugin for Drupal 8, right? So we're kind of, we're setting ourselves free of any of these systems by doing this. If, um, have any of you used WordPress before? Have you used WordPress lately? Have you used this editor lately? Have you turned it off immediately like everyone that uses WordPress lately? Yeah. Good, there was a few laughs. Okay, so I don't like, I mean, I'm not a huge fan of Gutenberg per se. Like, I don't hate it, but I do not like that image, so I got rid of it right there. And um, then, right, so are you going to be able to inject Gutenberg into your website? Now, this has no practical application other than this joke right here that I got rid of Gutenberg using hacks. But why is the Gutenberg editor tied to WordPress? 
if you've looked at it. It's an amazing piece of decoupled architecture, but it's still tied into WordPress. And everything that you output into the DOM has WP hyphen blah 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 block JSON blobs that effectively on the front end then unpack and, and render. But why? Why do you need any of that? Right? If there's all these, if if uh, Jesus Olimar was talking about was he talking, he was talking about Gatsby and basically static citing your Drupal site and then Gatsby comes in and it just puts it out there and it's static and then he said and then you just turn your Drupal site off. Why, if you can decouple this heavily, why are you tied to a platform at all? Why do you have everyone going into WordPress and turning off the Gutenberg editor? Because it's tied to WordPress and Gutenberg. Now, it's not to say it won't get better, right? These things will get better. But I think it's important that we ask these questions, like why do we have these assets and things that are still tied to platforms for every use case? There's, lot, there's plenty of use cases where it does make sense. But this is the... The editor we're building, it boils down to a single tag. It's H hyphen A hyphen X. And we can apply it to any website, and it will understand all of its directions as to how to set itself up. Now, yes, that is just orchestrating a static content area. But um, with that, I'd like to open it up if there's any questions. We've got about five minutes left or so until, but we'll be here all day. So, yes? I wanted to say the answer to your question was in terms of like, where are we? I think, the, I think the question becomes, where do we have to um, maintain content and design within the system? And I think that what people have been trying to figure out is how much, at what point do I sort of break away from my content management to the editor of a web page that has all the, I want to put a picture here and this and that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really what you know we're all struggling with is how much do we, maintain within content management versus sort of the preform editor that we're talking about. And I think that's why people try to put that into Drupal or whatever content management system because they feel like they still want to be able to provide some level of control over that or be able to go back and change, you know, that component down the line. So I think what's interesting about what you're doing is that it's possible that since you're actually building that little component, that you can change it at some point. So that little image tag or that little video editor that you're putting in, I guess it's something that you say, hey, we're going to change the colors on that on that video player, and suddenly it's updated everything everywhere else. You know, it's like you now now you're able to, to actually affect the little pieces mm -hmm. of the pie. So I think that's why people. I, mean, I, I think that's the issue that we're all trying to. Yeah, and, I, and that's why I won't, like, I don't want to criticize anyone that's working on layout or paragraphs forever or any other initiative. It's, it, I mean, they're important, they're important questions to ask, but it's like, you see everybody say, oh, we should all go headless, and all of you are headless, right? Like, I'm, I'm saying that jokingly, because, like, my systems aren't. I have some progressively decoupled systems, which is a term that you can use in this, right? Like, React, you're going to go straight to headless, right? You're going to have something that's served up statically, that's a React site, but, like, all of us know React. Right? I'm trying to get somebody to give me the, the face like, no, okay, thank God. Because I, I don't, but I could work on that little card. Right? Like, there's so much tooling and onboarding involved to participate in the web, and it's ridiculous. I just want to make a stinking card. Right? <laughs> How many people just want to do like one small thing? And so that's where we started. Like, two years ago, we didn't do any of this stuff. And we came here and we showed what, like a button? We made a button that weekend. We did one button on one website, and we pushed it out to that one website, just as the button. Because using this approach, you're just kind of augmenting and slowly replacing what you already have. Now, to get up to like a full scale, like, you know, this is Hack CMS, which is kind of part of our reaction to Drupal entirely. This is just reading off HTML files. Hack saves them, because Hacks is the editing side, right? And so then I can select something and, and do whatever, which I just showed. But it... That's not going to solve every use case, but it'll solve a lot of super basic ones that I'm currently having to stand up really complex architecture just to attack, and I can get to those types of things progressively, like one piece at a time. I can work on the button or the card. I mean, we have a table. We have, we have an element that takes uh, CSV data and turns it into a table on the website just by copy and paste. That saves people in our organization like hours a piece per time they do that let alone the accessibility implications of generating a table 
of data that normally they would type by hand have room for error. So I think Web Components is a really important way to kind of bend the rules of, that we were all stuck abiding by previously. Because the browsers are now able to just handle these things. And by the end of the year, they'll handle them even faster. So, so like, okay. So what you've got here, you're talking about like that blob space, like mm -hmm. body field. So this would be great for giving folks that power to, hey, I don't want to be stuck with this minimal set of tools, and uh, it's a pain to create a table, and um, et cetera. Uh, but now, the thing that, well, one of the things that Drupal does well is that whole structured content, and um, I can create you know, these, these types of content, and mm -hmm. then reuse them and display them all these other places. So that would still be, like that's why we would still use Drupal to take advantage of that part, but we could incorporate this. Like I'm trying to understand yeah. how to take advantage of what. No, no, yeah, there. yeah. So sorry. So for the recording, the question. Well, it's quite, the point was, this isn't <laughs> going to solve every use case, right? This this blob editor. We basically made a edit the blob area, which gets rid of CK editor. Mm -hmm. Okay, so get rid of CK editor. But so groups that I won't name right now are very interested in this editor for giving content authors the ability to say, you know, I just want this to look like on the home page. And you actually can, right? So you can use, it's the one-to-one, -one, it's the same design asset. So my design team mocks up the home page, and it's disconnected from the team that's making those template areas that the content authors produce then, right? You're reducing the room for error of the content authors that are eventually gonna have to write an article or whatever that's not gonna be as produced, but that home page block if it's a web component, and if it has, in this case, it's, it's called hack schema, but if it has that hacks wiring, and then on the back end, the user hits edit on a node, and you say, oh, well, they're allowed to edit this thing, then it's giving them the definition so that they can edit it. So like the different tags we just put in there are per project. Hacks has no knowledge of what it's about to edit, other than like paragraph tags and bulleted lists. Everything else comes in at runtime like, oh, I know how to edit a CSV list. But why? Well, it's because a CSV list emits a little bit of JSON schema and says these are the fields and this is how to edit me, and the form is all built dynamically. So, like, let's say it's that content, this page here, right? And I had the image and that stuff, and I said I'm going to change this. Um, this current design is called Content Outline. And this new design is going to be called Simple Blog Site. And so this is the same website. I'll have to probably refresh it here. You even have to double refresh it. There we go. Still working the kinks on that. So I just turned that website into a blog. So I can probably bend your, your definition as to what the blog area of the website is, right? Because that's a single tag on the interface. And again, when we're just working in cards, we're like, well, yeah, it's a card, but as you keep going up higher and higher, right, that card on that interface is the same card that Chuck leveraged, identical, and all I had to do to implement it was copy and paste. It's not like copy and paste the definition. It's literally copy and paste the exact, you know, version. It's the, it's the, the meaning of what that is. So in this case, that blob area, that the blob area, so there's the same exact post that I just showed before. Right, because it's a static file that I'm saving it out to, but it's completely disconnected from the design layer. So while it's not the end all be all to everything, I honestly think Web Components is by itself, which is why I won't stop talking about it, or I blog about it, or I tweet about it all the time. Like this is the solution to so many problems. <laughs> it's just, and it's the first step. <laughs> Another thing I just wanted to ask about, um, so you were talking about how, uh, so you have this component and you can use it everywhere and it looks exactly the same, um, you know, everywhere you're going to use it, but I'm going to have somebody who says, I want that blue instead of red. Yep. So, so, so it, you can, you're, it's flexible? Yes, yeah, so the, the question was like, do you have design flexibility still in order to add criteria, right? So there's a couple different ways you could do that. I mean, like, Web Components is like a whole, there's a whole events that are around these techniques, but so, you could either say, all right, well, I have an attribute, and the attribute is color, and then in the CSS, it's locally scoped, say, colon host, color equals blue, do this, right? You can do that with any number of properties. To do, like, very, very API-specific, like, I want to switch between these things, or if you say, 
you know, no float as a property, then leverage it in the CSS, or you can use CSS variables, and the CSS variables can cascade down through everything. So you could set the CSS variables at the top, and maybe it's like call, uh, dash dash my hyphen global hyphen font. And then in your element set, you leverage my hyphen global font. Yeah, so there, there is the ability, but what's nice is that because the outside doesn't bleed in, and the inside doesn't bleed out, and it happens with JavaScript too, you can, you're working on that little tiny scope, so you know it'll look exactly the way you want to, and then it's like you as the developer are in charge, or designer, or whoever, of saying, well, people can style this within reason. Right, it's like you're tweaking the rules that are in place. So if you want a, a padding, or if you want the front page card to actually leverage all the same code as like the bottom of a footer card, you can do that and just tweak one property. So it's, it's like a new tool in the toolkit, basically. Yeah, Rich. So the fiber is like Angular and React, and one of the problems is the performance penalty from having to download the library. Okay. Your JS size is so large over time. How does, like, how does it work with your web components? Like, you have to still go download those definitions. So you, you mentioned before, like, you have to go grab those 200 components and kind of give them to you. Are like, you noticing a performance penalty? There? That is in our context, right? So like, hacks leverages X amount. I then have 160 some, and because we're doing demos and stuff, obviously I'm gonna have a build that has all of those available. So. Yeah, I mean, there's going to be a performance penalty in getting those raw things. So are those components all coming all at once, or are they coming on demand? If you're on a page, does it need 180? So there is a big deal coming at the end of the year called Dynamic Imports, and it's coming to Firefox. Everybody else supports Dynamic Imports while Edge is switching over. So it's like, this is why this is the year that, like, this is, w w when we talked about this a year or two years ago, it was definitely, like, a interesting but like this is like it's time to be able to actually adopt this like it's reasonable to adopt the the imports thing though is important because js modules do spider through and they are blocking at some level right it's going to go it's async but it's going to say like oh i'm going to go out and i'm not going to execute any of this javascript until I, I know what the tree is and then execute it so when doing this for like a production environment you would want to put you know plan around that that part of the capability or the, the way it works, right? To say like, well, what is the minimum I need to ship in order to get a, a, a first paint? And then more so like dynamically import the Wikipedia card or whatever the less used ones, right? So um, what's, the, what's the framework that actually handles that really elegantly? Uh, Stencil. Stencil makes web, is, is another library, we haven't mentioned it because it's like a compiled library, but it really elegantly handles that like Oh, you're about to show that component, and I don't have the definition yet. Let me go get it from this place, for for that reason. Um, we've also found web components are way more performant than the other things you just mentioned. Like I've had 10,000 DOM nodes as uh, as different custom element tags, and the thing hasn't fallen over. Now, inspecting the DOM and manipulating it, like Chrome will get pretty ticked off, and Firefox will get pretty ticked off at that because it's trying to track everything going on, but. Um, it's a lot more of a figure out how to deal with the flash and run style content slash first you know, transmission, and then future transmissions are lightning. Because if you think, now I'm sending you less HTML. So when you hit refresh, right, you've already got the definition. So now, as long as you're, you know, where they're coming from is set, is set correctly, it's just going to reload the page. Right, and you're just going to have the definitions. That makes, that makes a lot of sense. The page, yeah. the page weight has to be a lot lighter, right? Yeah, um, it's also... Um, I mean, I know you're in a specifically in an education context with these. It's a little different from us. Like we can we can kind of cheat on this, right? So like if you read documentation, it's all about pushing to those criticals, right? Because I want you to buy a widget, but if I want you to go find out information about the library, <laughs> if you have to wait an extra two seconds, like, and you get this yeah, amazing performance improvement <laughs> as far as your workflow and your quality of life, then it's worth two seconds at that point. But yeah, there are there are definitely ways to get more in the weeds around those things. Yes. So what are the top three things you think that this benefits? Like, what are the top three benefits of it? So the question is, what are the top three benefits of web components, yes. you mean? Yes. Just adopting web, it? Web components. So, so I'd say um, long-term sustainability. Because, so for example, if we roll out a button, 
as Chuck mentioned, that, that button has accessibility things built into it, but let's say it didn't, right? Like that we made it by hand. I don't have to think about where that button's made. I can update that one package location and then everywhere that button's made will get the accessibility improvements. Now it could cut the other way, you could screw up the button and screw it up everywhere, right? But because you can test it in a vacuum, you know that it's not going to bleed through, right? Like a lot of regression testing previously was around CSS and JavaScript bleeding through. And so, not that you don't have to test, but you're not going to get into like eyeballing and tests that you had before and it being a problem. Um, so accessibility and sustainability, they're kind of the same. Um, also, uh, we haven't had to, other than changing specifications, because we adopted elements too early, I'll say, like as of six months ago was the right time to start adopting them, uh, that code should never change. Like I'm not, I'm not going, oh, how do we make this work in fill in the blank. Um, all of the libraries that we mentioned in passing are all compatible at a data layer. So you can use all those components together. You could also then, you know, Rich mentioned uh, uh, Angular, you could then throw these into an Angular app and they would just work. Right, so if your team does Angular, does a Drupal website, does a, you know, a view, a view app, does a native, a native application, you can leverage those in every place. Like YouTube.com leverages elements that are actually in the Chrome browser. If you go in and inspect settings panels, they actually come up as web components. Um, this allows you to, web components allows you to build like a pattern lab style component system, but each of those elements is their own API, and that is. That's transformative. Yeah, so that one, the API button. <laughs> so, How we got into this is that we went from Angular JS to Angular 2, and none of our stuff worked. Yeah. And I was trying to implement a calendar picker that wouldn't work between versions. That's that's like yeah. that should never happen again. So if you make a great calendar picker, then you never have to again, or a great icon picker, or whatever, right? You can kind of abstract it, not have to re-implement it, not reinvent the wheel just because you switch out the fact that it's WordPress instead of Drupal or what have you. So it kind of, it helps set you free from those decision trees. So we're way over time and people keep trying to come in, but thank you all for listening. We'll be at the after party if anyone wants to ask more questions or whatever.